So we're here today to talk about clinical use of cylinder applicator in HDR brachytherapy. So here are the learning objectives for this session. We're going to try and <clears throat> recognize the operational process in developing a treatment plan for brachytherapy. We're going to perform HDR treatment planning for a variety of applicator types. We're going to perform plan checks on HDR brachytherapy treatment plans, and we're going to understand uncertainties involved in the use of cylinders <clears throat> with HDR brachytherapy. Here's an overview for the, present, for the presentation. We're going to start with a brief overview of, you know, what is a cylinder? <clears throat> why would we want to use a cylinder to treat endometrial cancer? We're going to look at some of the pre-planning questions. So what does the applicator reconstruction look like? What are the planning aims? We're going to look at the insertion and some talk about some key points involved in <clears throat> inserting the cylinder and things to think about. Imaging, whether or not we need imaging, as a matter of fact, for cylinders. We're going to talk about connecting and measuring, treatment delivery, and then some important things to consider <coughs> when, when performing the procedure. So here's an overview of the cylinder. You can see what the cylinder looks like on the bottom left of the screen. Typically, we would call this a segmented cylinder. This is because we can vary the length of the cylinder. So really only two things that we can vary the length of in, in the cylinder treatment. We can vary the length of the cylinder. So we can add segments to make it longer. We can remove segments to make it shorter. And we can also vary the width of the cylinder. So you can see in the <clears throat> bottom middle of the screen here, those segments come in different widths. Okay, and the goal here is really to treat endometrial cancer. And typically we're using cylinders in the context of when there has been a, a hysterectomy has been performed. So this is when the uterus has been surgically removed. And then we're really trying to treat the upper portion of the vagina here in case that there's some sort of some residual cells left over from the cancer that weren't removed with a hysterectomy. Does that make sense for everybody? Yeah. Tim, I feel like my internet connection is maybe a little choppy. Are you getting that as well? You sound pretty good to me. Okay, great. Doesn't feel too bad, so. <clears throat> Perfect. So yeah, the goal, uh, you can see on the upper right-hand corner here, if I can get my mouse, the goal is to treat this upper part of the vaginal wall, okay? <clears throat> And in terms of how many channels we have or, you know, where we're going to run the source through, we just have one single option here, and it's this metal tube that runs through the center of the cylinder. So we're going to run the source through the cylinder, and we'll stop at various locations. The length of time that we stop at will determine what the dose distribution looks like <clears throat> for that specific patient. So cylinders are really perfect for pre-planning. And, and the reason for that is because they have a fixed geometry, right? So the cylinder geometry doesn't change. The only things that change, as we mentioned on the last slide, are the diameter of the cylinder and the active treatment length that we're going to use. So that means, <clears throat> unlike applicators that we're going to talk about in upcoming sessions that do not have a completely fixed geometry, this does have a fixed geometry, and because it has a fixed geometry, it's really ideal <clears throat> for pre-planning. So what does this mean? This means that we could actually create a plan for these cylinders before we've even inserted it in, into the patient and before we've even acquired any images, right? Because we know the geometry of it, we could put that geometry into our treatment planning system and generate a treatment plan <clears throat> without even having the cylinder inserted in the patient. <coughs> Excuse me. This is something really nice about cylinders because pre-planning is just far more safe than active planning or planning once the cylinder is placed in the patient. It's incredibly efficient. You don't need to spend a lot of time planning. It's safe. And it, for cylinders, it's generally the, the best option. So we would definitely recommend the use of pre-plans. And then, so you would end up having a set of pre-plans for each cylinder length, each cylinder diameter, and whatever the prescription may be. So in some cases, we might be treating to the surface of the cylinder, as is the case here. And in other cases, we may be treating five millimeters away from the surface of the cylinder. So you would have just a set of, essentially a set of library plans that you would pull up and use depending on the specific circumstances. Are there any questions about that? Gregory, did you have a question? It doesn't no. look like it, Derek. Not right now, anyway. 
Okay, so we're going to use applicator models if available. So some vendors with some treatment planning systems will actually have applicator models already embedded within the treatment planning system. And if we have those, we should definitely make use of them. We should take a CT of the applicator and use those images to, to manually reconstruct the single catheter. So this is, a, this is a CT image of a cylinder just inserted in a phantom. This is not a patient. And it has a dummy wire inserted through that single central catheter. So this would allow us to then go ahead and digitize this. So digitizing just means let, telling the treatment planning system where in three-dimensional space we have the ability to place seed positions. And then we could go ahead and generate treatment plans. Hey, Derek, so we would uh, need... Sorry, I have a okay. question about that. I know that we come across it in our clinic. Can you talk a little bit about the specifics of digitizing that dummy wire and what might be might go wrong in that process? Yep, that's a, that's a great question, Tim. Let me just see if I can go back here. So if you're looking here, <clears throat> what you see is a dummy wire. So it's essentially a, a non-radioactive metal wire that's inserted into the central channel of the cylinder. And then we're going to go ahead and essentially place points along here that will describe a line that will allow the treatment planning system to know where we can have source positions. And so if we're digitizing, <clears throat> and I think this is what you're getting at, Tim, and let me know if it's not, when we're doing this digitization process, if we didn't put the dummy wire all the way to the top of the cylinder, then we may start our digitiz digitization process down here or wherever the wire, however far the wire was inserted. And then of course we would, you know, be delivering incorrect treatment plans. So you want to make sure when you have your dummy wire inserted into your cylinder and you're going to use it for digitization, you want to make sure it's all the way to the tip of the cylinder. And it can be in some cases, um, depending on the setup of, of when you're doing your CT scan, you could put the dummy wire all the way in. You could put it to the end and feel, feel the end of that under catheter. And then when you let it go, it could fall out a little bit, depending on the setup that you use when you do your CT scan. So it's also good practice when once you place the dummy wire, you can put a, a little bit of tape on the dummy wire that will prevent it from slipping inside the catheter. Is that, is that where you were going with that, Tim? Yeah, definitely that. I think that's a really great point. And then the other thing is just that the channel itself is actually straight, even if the dummy wire may be a little bit crooked. And so I think it's important to digitize down the center of the channel and not spend so much time following the exact path of the wire because you know that it's a, a solid applicator. You know that it's a straight channel. Yeah, that, that's such a great point <clears throat> tim so just to click just to add on to that a little bit it, it, when you push this wire in there is a little bit of space between the wire and the channel wall and that can result in a little bit of a zigzag in the wire and what tim is saying here is <clears throat> we shouldn't digitize that zigzag because it would be different every time you inserted the wire so we're just going to say this channel is completely straight all the way down the middle here even if the dummy wire is sort of zigzagging back and forth within that channel. And then Derek, just, just to make a comment on yeah, what you mentioned earlier, your internet is a little bit jumpy. So okay. I don't know if there's, I mean, it, it's fine. I can hear everything, but I just want to let you know in case there was something you wanted to look into. Uh, okay. But. Yeah. Just, just give me a flag if it, if it gets, if it gets any worse here, Tim. Yeah, sure. We'll do. Thanks. And we have a question in the chat from okay. Joel. If you want to unmute yourself, Joel, you can go ahead and ask that question, or I can read it aloud for, for everybody. I just asked you to unmute, I think, so we'll see. But I guess the question from Joel is, are the template, pe the template plans have a fixed treatment length, which might vary with the patient's vaginal length, and how you define, I guess, the active length? in your cylinder, which is a great question. Thanks. Hey, that, that's a really great question, Joel. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. And it, it, it is true that we would use different lengths for different patients. So we would, we would need to include those different lengths in our set of library plans, if that makes, if that makes sense. And we're going to talk about how we define the treatment act, treatment length or active length in, in just a minute. <clears throat> and this is kind of what we're looking at here, Joel, this is exactly what you were asking about. So this white line here that you see is the outside of the cylinder. And then we have this central catheter, which has been digitized. That's that green line that you see here. And this tells us where we can have positions. And at, you can see on this, if you look closely, you can see there are actually dwell positions already been placed in there. That's these little 
green boxes here, if you can see that on your screen. <clears throat> and then in this case, we're going to be prescribing to five millimeters from the surface of the cylinder. And we're going to have a planning aim length of three centimeters. So what, what does it mean <clears throat> to have a planning aim length? And this is just kind of a standardized way for us to define how far down the, the vaginal wall are we going to treat, right? So in this case, we're going to treat three centimeters. It could be that we're going to treat five centimeters. It could be that we're going to treat two centimeters. And that will be dependent on how far down the vaginal wall the radiation oncologist would like to treat. So that planning aim length is going to be part of the prescription. So two important things that need to be part of the prescription. How far away from the surface of the cylinder are we going to treat? In some cases, we're treating at the surface. In some cases, we're going to treat at 0.5 centimeters from the surface or five millimeters from the surface. Typically, those are the only two depths that we're going to treat at. And that so that's one important thing. How far away from the cylinder do we want the 100% isodose prescription to be? And the second important thing is how far down the vaginal wall are we going to treat? So we're going to define this term planning aim length. And that's going to go from <clears throat> the 100% isodose line at the apex of the, of the vaginal, wall, uh, vaginal cavity to the point where the 100% isodose line crosses our treatment depth, right? And that's three centimeters, three centimeters here. So <clears throat> if, this, if, we want, if we had been asked to treat to four centimeters or five centimeters, then we would need a plan where the 100% isodose line crossed at this point here. Does that make sense for everybody? It's, 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 an, it's an important point and it's an important safety item that we have this standardized across all of our patients and all of our, our, all of our treatment plans. And it also gives us a common understanding <clears throat> between our radiation oncologists and our physicists what we're talking about when we say, okay, we're going to treat three centimeters of the, of the vagina. Does that make sense for everybody? I feel like that was a little bit. Yes, of yes, it does. It does. Great. Okay. Excellent. Thank you for that. Hotspots are also an important consideration. <clears throat> Again, in brachytherapy, we're treating from the inside out. So it's fairly easy to overlook these hotspots. And for cylinders in particular, we want to have this 200% isodose line. That's this red line here that we're looking at. We want it to, that to be fully contained within the cylinder. And the reason for that is if we got too much dose on the vaginal wall, we might cause tissue necrosis, or which, would, which we would obviously want to avoid. So important point here is that we want to always make sure that this 200% isodose line is within the cylinder, the plastic portion of the cylinder, and not in the tissue. The way we would create this treatment plan, lots of different ways to create this treatment plan, to be honest, depending on your treatment planning system. One thing you could do is to create a series of dose points that are all at, at a five millimeter distance from the surface of the cylinder, <clears throat> and then optimize your treatment plan such that the 100% isodose matches those dose points. Because this is sort of an isocentric treatment, right? So we're, we're not going to be able to have a different isodose depth on this side of the cylinder as we have on this side of the cylinder. We really only need dose points on one side of the cylinder. If we optimize to those dose points on this side of the cylinder, we're going to get exactly the same dose distribution on this side of the cylinder. Typically, when we're talking about dwell time distribution for a cylinder with HDR brachytherapy, we have this concept of the hourglass. So this is a typical dwell time distribution. This is just showing dwell time distributions from two different planning systems. So in this case, we would have one, two, three, four, five, six positions. Most of our source lengths, although not all of them, would be five millimeters. So here we would be treating three centimeters, or our, the, the length of our dwell positions would be three centimeters. And then typically we would have more dwell time on the peripheral dwell positions than we would in the center. And that gives us this sort of hourglass shape. You see the same thing on the bottom here, more dwell time in the peripheral positions, less in the central positions. So why would that be? Why would we typically have this sort of hourglass shape for a cylinder? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? I think uh, it is because of, of the central point, uh, the dose is accumulated from all points. So you... So it was a little bit hard to hear that, so I'm just going to repeat it. What Mohammed was saying is that the central 
locations are receiving those contributions from all of the dwell times, whereas at the periphery, we're getting most of our dose, co dose contributions just from the peripheral dwell positions. So in order to have that sort of straight dose distribution that we were looking at, we need to have more in the periphery and less in the central channels. So Mohammed, that was really good. You, got, you said that exactly right. Exactly right. So that's typically what we would expect to see in our pre-plans for, for all of our cylinders. Again, the number of positions is going to vary depending on the length that we're treating, and the amount of time is going to vary depending on the depth that we're treating to. So whether we're treating at the surface or at five millimeters from the surface. Any questions about that uh, dwell time distribution? Looks like not. Okay, so here, here is exactly, again, what we're saying. If we uniformly loaded these positions, our, our dose distribution would look like this. And if we <clears throat> do this sort of hourglass loading that we talked about, then we can get a much flatter dose distribution at the depth that we want to treat. And that's, that's our goal, right? Definitely a good idea to use an independent dose calculation. So just like when we do external beam radiation therapy, we would always want to do a secondary dose calculation to make sure that our monitor units that we've calculated are correct. Same, same thing goes for brachytherapy. Whenever we create a plan, whether it's a pre-plan or active plan, we would want to do an independent dose calculation. And this can be done in the form of a spreadsheet. There are lots of different programs available, web-based programs <clears throat> available that can do this TG43 calculation. I think we've talked about TG43 in previous sessions. So at this point, we're probably aware that the TG43 dose calculation is actually a fairly simple calculation. And it can actually be replicated in an Excel spreadsheet at a clinic that I used to work at. We had this one that you see here. So you would just put in your positions of all your sources, your source strength, and then you would calculate that, that those dose points and see how they compare to what you created in your treatment planning system. So definitely important to have an independent dose calculation for any plan that we do in radiation oncology and HDR cylinders are, are no exception to that. Okay, so here is our first poll question. When optimizing a treatment plan for uniform dose along the cylinder, we use gr greater dwell weight <clears throat> or time on the ends of the treatment length because dwell positions on the ends of the treatment length are the ones contributing to dose at the ends of the treatment length. We don't use as many dose points at the tip of the applicator. The treatment length is only a few centimeters or dwell positions in the middle of the treatment length contribute less to the middle of the cylinder. So, thank you, Tim. So everyone, feel free to, to take an answer. We'll leave this open for probably about a minute or until we get read about 50% response. So maybe, maybe 10 more seconds and, and then we'll end it so we can move on with the presentation and go over, go over the discussion for the answers here. All right, so I'm gonna be closing the poll in about three, two, and we'll close it. And we'll share those results. Thanks everybody for participating. Yes, thank you very much. And I, I think this one is a, is a little bit difficult because I think the wording is, is potentially a little bit confusing between the first and the last answers there. They do sound sort of similar, but given the results of that poll, maybe let's just go back a step here and have a look again at <clears throat> why we would want to load more on the peripheral dwell times. So it, a little bit difficult to see here, but this is gonna be our cylinder channel along the middle here. And these green dots are represent source positions. And in the top example, we have a uniform dwell time loading. So if we have 10 seconds here, we have 10 seconds here, 10 seconds here, and so on, all the way across. Then the dose distribution is gonna look something like this. So it's sort of bulged uh, out away from the cylinder. Whereas in this case here, we have more loading in the peripheral one. So if we have 10 seconds here, then maybe we have seven seconds here, five seconds, three seconds, three seconds, five, seven, and back up to 10 by the time we get over here. That's gonna give us this sort of flat dose distribution along the length of the vaginal wall. And that of course is preferable to what we would get if we did that here. And the reason for that is that this, these dose points here are getting contribution from all of these dwell positions, right? So we don't need as much dwell time in the center. Whereas these dose points over here are only really getting dose contribution from the peripheral ones. So we need more time in the peripheral ones to get the dose out 
to here than we do in the center ones because we're getting dose contribution from all of the dwell positions in the center. So if we go back to look at that question, the correct answer would be A, dwell positions on the ends of the treatment length are the only ones contributing to dose at the ends of the treatment length. <clears throat> A lot of us chose the last one, D, dwell positions in the middle of the treatment length contribute less dose in the middle of the cylinder. So again, a little bit oddly worded, but the correct one here would be A. Any questions about that? Yeah, and I think just, you know, for my own clarification in terms of the wording, the ends are getting some dose from the central positions, right? So only is a little bit of a misleading word in this answer, um, but right. it is primarily from those end positions. Yeah, that's good clarification too. Okay, so we have our treatment plans and we have a series of treatment plans that we're going <clears> to, <throat> that we can, that we can use. Let's talk a little bit about things to consider when we're doing the insertion of the cylinder. When, when we do the insertion of the cylinder, when we make our choice about the diameter of the cylinder, we want to choose the largest cylinder diameter that the patient can tolerate comfortably. So why would that be? We have a little bit of a clue if you look at the images on the right, but why would we want to choose the largest diameter? Why not just use a smaller diameter or a, a relatively small diameter for all of our patients? Anyone have any ideas on that? This is great that we're going over it. I actually wrote this question down as a beginning to ask, so... <laughs> I, I think it's because to eliminate any air gaps between the vaginal wall and the cylindric applicator. Yep, that is that's a really excellent answer. That's that's exactly right. So we want to we want to try and minimize air gaps between the cylinder and the vaginal wall. So you can see here this cylinder. Not only is it not inserted far enough, so there's an air gap here, but it's also probably not a large enough diameter because we have also air gaps on the side. So we, in this case, we would want to use a large, a larger diameter cylinder. And you can see that here as well, there's an air gap on the side of the cylinder. If we're seeing air gaps on the side of the cylinder, that means we could probably have used a larger diameter cylinder. And this just, again, ensures that we're treating everything that we want to treat. If we have air gaps here, then the prescription is no longer five millimeters of tissue. And now it's going to be down to three millimeters of tissue. Hey, Derek, so I have very, a very important, of course, the, the patient needs to, yep, go ahead, Tim. So I had a question. So we can treat these without imaging. Do you know of a way to ensure that we have the right size cylinder if we're not imaging? Not really, just as large as the patient can tolerate. So, you know, the patient, the, you can't have your patient screaming in pain for every one of these treatments, but you want the cylinder to be as large as the patient can tolerate. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions about that from the group? So once we have the cylinder inserted, we also need some sort of mechanism to ensure that the cylinder stays in place. Again, we want to fully insert the cylinder. And if a cylinder is inserted fully and it's fairly large for, with respect to the patient anatomy, typically it, it would come out of the patient if we didn't have some sort of device to hold it inside the patient. So after, after insertion, the applicator should be fixed in place. This avoids slipping out and, and it creates a reproducible setup. And this can be done using any number of different techniques. You can have this sort of arm that uh, clamps onto the cylinder and holds it in place. You can have this sort of underwear with a strap that holds the cylinder in place, or you can have some sort of a board, <clears throat> again, with a clamp that attaches to the cylinder, and then the patient would lie on top of that board and the cylinder would be held in place. But it, important for the group to realize if we are using these cylinders, we're definitely gonna need some way of ensuring that they are in place reproducibly. So when we go to deliver the treatment, the cylinder is in the same place that it was when we inserted the cylinder. Any questions about that? Is some mobilization? No, okay. So imaging, imaging for cylinders is optional. If you have the ability to image, then it's, it's probably a good idea. As Tim mentioned, it is the only way we're going to be able to see air gaps. If we don't have imaging, however, we're just going to choose the largest cylinder available or that the patient can tolerate, and we can go with that. So imaging, definitely optional. We're using pre-plans, so we're, we don't need to use imaging.
changing to generate treatment plans. It's great to check for applicator insertion and no significant air gaps like we've just talked about. If it's not possible, we can treat without imaging using a pre-plan. We're going to use a pre-plan regardless of whether we have imaging or not. And again, very important that we're going to triple check the correct plan is selected for the patient, right? So that's the one downside of using pre-plans is that it, it does make it possible for you to select the incorrect plan. So let's say we're treating a three centimeter diameter cylinder to a three centimeter planning length, and we choose a two centimeter cylinder, a pre-plan that has a two centimeter cylinder and a three centimeter planning length, then of course we would be significantly overdosing the patient. So very, very important when we're using these pre-plans that we select the correct plan for the setup that we have and for the prescription. That we have. Okay, connecting and measuring. So once the cylinder is inserted and once we have the cylinder appropriately immobilized so it doesn't move around in the patient, doesn't come out of the patient, we're going to do some checks. So we're going to check that the overall applicator plus transfer tube length is correct. So we can do this using a dummy wire and a measurement system. This allows us also to check for blockages and it allows us to make sure that we've connected the transfer guide tube to the cylinder appropriately and that there's nothing in the way so that when we do run the source through the cylinder, we know that it's not gonna get stuck. This has to be done for all applicators and all, all channels for all treatments. So anytime we're going to run the source through a transfer guide tube and into an applicator, it doesn't matter if it's a cylinder, doesn't matter if it's tandem ovoid, which we're gonna talk about next week, we're going to run a dummy wire through that system to ensure that it's free of blockages. That allows us to ensure that it's free of blockages for one thing, but also allows us to actually measure that length and make sure that that length is what we have in our treatment planning system. Hey, Any Derek. Yeah. We have a couple questions about the insertion in the chat. One from Halidu <clears throat> and one from Rebecca that maybe we can talk about before talking about connecting and measuring the cylinder. Yeah. Halidu wanted to just talk about the placement of the cylinder and if it's in the same for each treatment and for the whole time. Could you repeat that? Just talking about the, the placement for the cylinder and if it's it's in the same place for the whole treatment time and every fraction and maybe how you, how you know that is kind of the question there. Yep. So that, that's a really great question. How do you essentially, how do you know? So the, the, the cylinder diameter and the treatment length are going to be the same for every single fraction for a, a specific patient. Um, how we know that it's in position that when we're doing the insertion, we push the cylinder all the way in until it hits the end of the vaginal wall. And once it hits the end of the vaginal cavity, then we're going to mobilize it in place. And that, that's really, if we don't have imaging and if we're not going to image for every fraction, which we don't do, the only way we really know that it's inserted properly is because the radiation oncologist has inserted it all the way until they feel the resistance of the end of the vaginal wall. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that that's a great explanation. If there's more questions about that specifically, we can talk about it at the end, I think. Okay. Uh, and then the question from Rebecca. Rebecca, if you want to unmute yourself and ask, you can. I don't know if I'll be able to find you in this list of people. I, I see the question here as well. So in, in the case of significant gaps, what, optimize, what optimization options do we have? Or is it only to do with the, the insertion of the cylinder? And the answer, that, that's a great question. The answer is that we do not have any ability to really optimize the dose to account for air gaps. And again, the reason for that is we have this sort of isotopic, isotropic dose distribution. So let me just go back a little bit to here. I think we, we probably see it best here. And we talked about it a little bit here, right? Whatever dose distribution we have on this side of the cylinder is exactly what we're going to have on this side of the cylinder. So if we had a significant air gap here and we push the dose out to account for that air gap, we would have the same thing happen over here. And so that would push this isodose line out here. And we would, then, then we would essentially be overdosing on the one side of the cylinder that didn't have the air gap. So because of the setup that we have here and because we have this single channel, we really don't have any option to optimize for air gaps. So it makes it all the more important that we use as large a cylinder diameter that the patient can tolerate. And that will, as much as possible, reduce air gaps at the side of the cylinder. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, thanks for taking the time to answer those questions, Derek. And like I said, if we have any further questions or discussion about that, we can re revisit it at the end of the session. Great. Just like 
Uh, when, we, when we're doing any treatment in radiation oncology, we want to do a timeout before we actually deliver. So we've, we, we have our pre-plans, we've selected our appropriate pre-plan, we've inserted the cylinder into the patient, we've immobilized the cylinder so that it's not going to move, we've done our blockage check and our treatment length check using our dummy wire, and we're about to tell the afterloader, okay, go ahead and deliver treatment. We, before we press that button, we want to do a timeout. So a timeout should ensure that we have the correct patient. That's obviously important. Ensure that we have the correct cylinder diameter. Again, important. Ensure that we've selected a plan that has the correct planning aim length, correct source strength, and that there are no other people except the patient in the room. So it's super easy to do. It takes about 20 seconds and can be very, very effective in ensuring that you have the correct patient, correct diameter cylinder, correct treatment, planning aim length, source strength, and that the room is clear. So just like any treatment in radiation oncology, we would want to do a timeout before we actually deliver the treatment. Pre-plans should be of the highest quality. <clears throat> Why do we need high quality pre-plans? So the reason for that is if we're using pre-plans and we have a poor pre-plan or poor, poor quality plan, then every single patient that we treat with that plan is going to receive a poor quality treatment. Treatment, right? So if we're doing pre-plans, we don't have the patient waiting in the room while we're doing the planning. So we can take our time and create really, really high quality plans that we can use for all of our patients. And then all of our patients that are treated with those plans will have high quality treatments. So really important in, in the setting of using pre-plans that you want to have really good pre-plan. We want to ensure that the cylinder diameter in the patient matches the cylinder diameter in the pre-plan being used. We talked a little bit about this already, but if we use a small, it, particularly in the case of a, a smaller diameter cylinder than we were planning to use, and then we use a pre-plan for a larger diameter cylinder, we can really significantly overdose the patient in that setting. And it can be easily up to 200% overdose, which is obviously not, not something that we would want to do. So very, very important that the cylinder diameter in the pre-plan matches the cylinder diameter that we're using in, in the patient. Does that make sense for everybody? If we used a larger diameter cylinder than we had in, in our pre-plan, then we would be underdosing the patient. So equally bad. We really, really want to make sure that the diameter matches. So Derek, I think those are great points about the selection of the correct cylinder. And I'm not sure if you're going to get to it later in the presentation, but there are some questions in the chat regarding, particularly when you don't have imaging, how you know the dose to the organs at risk or how you address that. Yep. That, that is a really, really great question. I love that question. So in the context of treating the vaginal wall, we're either going to be treating to the surface of the cylinder or to five millimeters away from the surface of the cylinder. And in the, in the context of that and the anatomy of the surrounding organs at risk, so that would be rectum, bladder, and sigmoid, none of those are within that five millimeter tissue window. So for a cylinder, as long as we have the correct diameter of the cylinder, we're really not concerned about doses to organ at rest because none of them are within that, that sort of prescri prescription isodose length. So the answer to your question is that for these cylinders, as long as we choose the correct cylinder diameter and we have a high quality plan, we're not concerned at all about organs at risk for cylinders. That is very, very different in the context of tandem and ovoid or tandem and ring, which we're going to talk about next week. But in the case of this a cylinder, we don't worry at all about doses to organ at risk. Great question. Tim, were there other questions in the chat about that? No, we just had a couple of people ask the same thing. So great. Thanks for the explanation. And then I think we can move on. Okay. We've said this a bunch of times, just like we need to check the, ensure that we have the correct diameter of the cylinder. We also want to ensure that we have the planning aim treatment length is, is correct for the desired planning aim treatment length. If we choose a different one, then we're going to mistreat, mistreat the patient, essentially. Selecting a shorter treatment length, patient has suboptimal dose. Selecting a larger treatment length, there'll be some overdose. So equally as important as selecting the correct cylinder diameter. Okay, second and last poll, poll question here. Why is it okay to treat a cylinder patient treatment without imaging them? Option A, all endometrial patients are the same. Option B, it takes too long to image each patient. Option C, we want to reduce radiation dose to the patient. Or option D, 
optimized treatment plans are already pre-planned. Great. So we'll take another maybe minute to get some answers on this, get at least 50% participation. And then Derek, there's another question in the chat that right after this poll, we can we can address from Joel. And Joel, you can feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like, or Derek, I can we can read the question from the chat. So maybe we'll give it another 30 seconds on the poll. And just give everybody an appropriate opportunity to get an answer in if they'd like. Okay, maybe 10 seconds. All right. Okay, great. So uh, the vast majority of us got this one right. Optimized treatment plans are already pre-planned. And that's the, that's the main reason we, we're not going to need imaging for these patients. Some of us chose that all endometrial patients are the same. So that's not the case, right? We have, we'll have patients with different, different diameter vaginal cavities. We'll have patients with, that require different treatment lengths. Some of us also chose, we want to reduce radiation dose to the patient. So this is in general, a good concept, right? We don't want to over-treat the patient, but not imaging the patient wouldn't really impact our ability to reduce doses to the patient, right? If we were imaging the patient, then we might have an opportunity to do that. But if we're not imaging the patient, then we can't, then we have no information with which to use to, to reduce the dose. So the correct answer, optimized treatment plans are already pre-planned. And that's the main reason we're not going to need to image, image these patients. Okay. Thanks very much for that, everybody.